Hello everybody and welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Last week, one of the cases we talked about took place in the Shetland Isles. If you missed last week's podcast, I'll give you a quick update of events and then I'll share an update from Holly. This week, Holly explained she had a supernatural encounter. She wanted to share that happened to her at home. After we hear from Holly, I have some reports to share that we have recently received that also include a strange being that is seen at home. The experiences are unique and individual to each person. I am merely sharing their words with you as they were written. Holly said, when I was a child, I was camping in the Perthshire woods with my dad and it was about 3am on a bright, clear, moonlit night. We both seemed to wake at the same time to a grunting noise that was off in the distance. It wasn't a stag. I froze and I then heard heavy footsteps approaching our tent and they were purposeful almost creeping, as if to dampen the noise of the steps. I could tell it was something walking on two feet, but it sounded and felt really heavy. A large shadow appeared at the side of the tent, and I could see as it circled around camp, and it then walked off, out of the clearing where we camped, and back into the woods. When I was in Aberdeenshire, I lived in a house in the woods, and I was going for my usual evening walk through the forest, but I suddenly felt an instinctive danger, a gut warning to get the heck out of there, which was strange because I love being in the woods. But what I felt that day was primal fear. It sounds mad, but I felt hunted. It's something I've never felt before, and I hope I don't ever feel it again. I heard the cracking of twigs getting closer to me and a deep, guttural, grunting, growling which I sensed was beginning to circle me and that circle was getting smaller and I ran out of those woods. I got onto the small road and ran back to my house. My fiancé and I were living in Argyll and there is quite a lot of military activity there. I'd wake about 2, 3 a.m. to just look out of the bedroom window. I see deer and foxes and owls and sometimes even pine martins. At this time in July, I was looking out and something big momentarily caught my eye. It was moving between the trees in a bit of a clearing and just for a moment and then it was gone. It was something upright and it was on two legs. I wondered if I was seeing things and I continued looking and I saw what seemed to be several soldiers with guns moving purposefully and quickly along the same route as whatever I saw was moving. This may have been a military exercise, but I often wonder about this. I've heard stories from an elderly acquaintance about very tall, hairy, human-like creatures that were spotted on the hilltops, usually in lambing time, in the middle of the night. Now, this would have been back in the 60s, Deb, and I haven't heard anything more recent. Well, I actually heard from Holly again during the week and she said a sighting that you shared last week has brought up so many questions for me Deb. Recently I've seen what I thought was just another human spirit in my home. I have my medium switch set to off as a means of self-care so I see spirit and I'm aware of them still but I don't let them fully come through until I set a specific time for it. I've noticed a white whoosh going around my home like a pre-materialisation. I used to see sparkles with people. And on Thursday last week, I visited my dad on the island I grew up on, and it was magical. I felt so happy. That evening, I was sitting on the sofa with Stanley, my cat, and a huge white wolf with bright blue eyes came through the door and stood at the bookcase. They were observing me, and I got the sense they were bipedal. But when they popped their head around the door to look at me, they were lower to the ground with their arms down. And it's the strangest thing, because at the time, just before they appeared, a calm came over me and I felt so much love. When they appeared, I felt so safe and happy, no threat. And part of me questioned if I was seeing things. But at the same time, my cat Stanley 
turned around to look into the spot where I was seeing the wolf. And he's usually a bit timid, but he too was calm and relaxed. And he could obviously see what I saw. I meant to say, whatever the huge benevolent wolf-like creature was, his face was almost like a wolf crossed with a bear and an Alsatian, but they were white and silver in colour. It was like nothing I've ever seen, and it sounds completely bonkers. And I questioned if I was hallucinating it or something. But my cat looked at the same time, in the same spot that I saw this being, as he does when someone he's comfortable with walks in. I can still feel their energy around. They seem to be observing me and protecting me. The incident came on the same day as a significant healing of past trauma in my life. Is there a connection? On this day, I also hugged my favourite ancient standing stone. Interestingly, on the island of Unst, there is a network of underground houses and tunnels from very long ago. The people who own the land made a livelihood from it and didn't want archaeologists disturbing it, what had been there for centuries or more. Also, this being seemed to be able to either cloak itself and materialise as spirits do, which leads me to wonder if perhaps they can pop through from another dimension, as I experience the spirit world too. And then, then it just stood there for maybe three to five seconds, and then it was gone. I was quite moved when I read Holly's message. It took me back to a time when I stopped fearing what was happening around me. I still see the peeking figures that pop around the doorway. But now the fear is gone, their approach to me is very different. Before, there were these big, powerful things that tired over me, which, in all honesty, was just too much. One night, I was a complete mess of rage and fear, and I just said, no, that's it, I'm done being scared. You either change your approach to me, or you will sit at my feet like a dog. I don't even know where those words come from. But the intent was mine and I meant it and it worked. I realised just accepting it was happening and not feeding that fear somehow softened it. Anyone who owns a dog knows the play bow. It's how dogs greet each other. They bow to each other and the play begins. Several weeks after my outburst, the visit started again. But now the faces will be low down on the floor arms far outstretched in front of them. That's acceptable for me. So I smile, say hello, and just carry on with what I was originally doing. But I f- f- remembered that movement when Holly was speaking about how they showed themselves to her with their arms out in front. Lots of people tell me that I hallucinate what I see or that I see things due to the pain meds that I take. Just one take on it, but my accident was 16 years ago, and I'm in my 50s. So simple mass blows that reason out of the water. It's changed for me because I changed what was acceptable to me. Holly is so connected to her island and her ancestors that walk beside her. It comes as no shock to me that she has her own Mac. Mac is the old Celtic word for wolf. Is Holly the first person to tune into the wolves in several thousand years in that area? I don't know. But I think if they were going to tune into anyone, it would be someone like Holly. Around the same time I received Holly's message, I got a message via Facebook by a young man named Liam who saw something very disturbing at home. And he starts his explanation with a previous encounter that can certainly be classed as unexplained. Hi Deborah, I recently heard you on Sasquatch Chronicles and up until then, I'd never really thought of cryptids in the UK. So through you, I've started looking into the subject and I have a couple of weird experiences that I don't mind you sharing. I was out one night with a friend of mine and had a pretty weird experience where we both saw what we can only describe as a slender man, a looking thin looking thing or person. I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but if I was going to make something up, I'd at least say it was something interesting like Bigfoot. 
I've also had a really scary experience with something at the bottom of my bed when I was a child and I woke up in a really weird position. For a bit of context, me and my good friend are car enthusiasts and we both enjoy driving and that's why we were out so late. I think we were seeing what my new suspension was like at the time. This happened about four years ago and I'd been 21, 22 at the time. I can't quite remember what time of year it was. I just remember the weather was dry and it wasn't too cold. So me and my mate decided to go for a drive in my car and explore some back roads here in the Lake District where I live. It was pretty dark outside, must have been 10pm, and there were literally no cars around up on the roads we were exploring. I was looking for a bit of dirt or a gravel car park to do some stupid stuff like handbrake turns where we wouldn't disturb anyone because it was late. We came around a corner and over a tiny bridge and I came to a stop. And just after the bridge, I pulled the car up slightly to the left-hand side of the road and I saw a kind of promising dirt gravel road that we could go and be idiots on. We were both looking over our left shoulder at the road and wondering if we should go down it and if the car, because it was lowered, would make it okay. I noticed a light at the bottom of the road and I assumed it was a house. So we decided not to go onto private property and we'd go back and look for somewhere else. As we went to set off driving, I flicked the high beams back on and as the beam pattern raised, we saw an old barn type building at the side of the road just behind a bit of greenery, maybe 20 metres out in front of us. And standing in the doorway was what we can only describe as a really tall person wearing a suit. You could see the outline of the white shirt and a bit of the blazer, but it had no face from what we can remember. It was the first thing that grabbed both our attention as I flicked the high beam on, and probably three to five seconds later, I wheel spun off or up the road to get out of there. We were both shouting, half screaming, laughing in hysterics. What the was that? We got about half a mile up the road and we decided to go back and check it out to see if we confused something with the figure that we'd seen. Again, I went back to the exact same spot we'd parked up on. I put the high beams on just as I'd done before and nothing was there. Now, I'm not saying we saw Slenderman, but we genuinely have no idea what else you describe it as. I went back to the building in the daytime a few weeks later, and there was nothing we could have confused it with. It was just an old oil drum in the barn. It was half rusty and half still had paint on it, but it was nowhere near the doorway and nowhere near the height of the figure that we saw. We still talk about that night to this day. We can't work out what we saw. And then Liam went on to explain another experience he had when he was a small child in bed. And he called it the thing at the bottom of my bed. Now, the experience took place many years ago, Deb. I still remember it pretty well. But as time goes on, it gets harder and harder to remember details like my exact age or etc. I think that's quite normal. It's the same for me. It's the same for lots of people. The event is incredibly vivid. But if somebody asks you what time of year it was, how old you were, it's really hard to remember how old you were when you were a child, you know, to put it into context. He said, again, this happened when I was living in the Lake District, but it was back at a time when I was a child of maybe 12. I'm not fully sure, but my brother's four years younger than me. And we were at the sort of age where we used to annoy and scare each other all of the time. I used to share a room with my brother. We both had a big, sturdy wooden bunk bed. I had the top bunk and he had the bottom. It wasn't an odd thing for him to try and prank or scare me by trying to grab my legs, you know, while climbing down or for him to shove his hands through the gaps in the wood to scare me. If he did this, it was always as we were going to bed or when we woke up in the morning. Definitely not at like 1 to 4 a.m. in the morning because my mum and dad would have gone absolutely mental if I woke them up at that time. So one night... I randomly woke up and it was nearly pitch black. The room was dimly lit from a motion activated light which would go on and off all night as it was windy and at the top of my housing estate, a good 100 metres up the road. Anyway, my attention was drawn to the foot of my bunk bed. I could see that there was this massive balloon-shaped thing there 
and it looked like it resembled a head, but it's way too big to be my brother's head. And he's not quite tall enough for his head to be at that height. I think at the time I just assumed it was my brother, but I could still hear him breathing on the bed, which was usually a telltale sign he was going to try and scare me. He'd go totally silent before he pounced. But tonight I could genuinely tell that he was asleep in his bunk. I started of thinking of rational things that it could be. It was almost like the light showing on an outline of the post of my bed on the wall. And when I moved my le head left and right, I could tell it was right at the foot of my bed and not at the wall at all. This thing then moved. It went down below the bed and I couldn't see the head for a while. I kept watching and then it slowly came back up, almost to its original position. But this time it was a few inches to the right. Needless to say, I was absolutely terrified and I moved. I got myself as far into the corner of my bed by the wall as I could. This thing started turning its head like a dog does when it's confused, but very slowly. Every movement it made was very slow. So uh, around this age, I'm really into making bases and dens and playing with guns. I had a weird obsession with lights and lasers. I had a big bicycle light under my pillow, so I slowly moved my hand to get hold of it. I counted to three in my head, and I leapt into the middle of my bed, and I shined that light at the bottom of my bed, and there was nothing there. I figured it was the head post again, or something else, casting a shadow, and I got back into bed, but I kept the light in my hand ready. I got back in, and I watched the bottom of the bed for a good few minutes. And it came back. Basically, I did the same thing another two times where I would jump to the bottom of my bed. But every time there'd be nothing there. If my brother was swinging about at the bottom of my bed, I'd have felt that. And I would have heard the bed move. Plus, he isn't that quick. I am 110% certain that it was not my brother. And the next day, he'd have teased me about it, which he didn't. I know at some point during this period, I started to kind of whisper, shout, you know, Mom, Mom, try to get louder. There was no response, which was weird, because usually the slightest thing wakes her up when she goes mental. I can't quite remember at what point I started for calling for Mum. As I said, some of the details have become a bit faint. Anyway, this is where it gets pretty messed up. I eventually fell asleep somehow. I was right up against the corner of the bed by the corner of the wall. But when I woke up, I was sitting with my arms and legs crossed, with my back to the open room, resting against the wooden railing. Now, I don't know about you, but any scared child tries to hide or get into the hardest place to reach. So they feel safe enough to drift off, like how I fell asleep. I definitely did not fall asleep in a position like this. There is absolutely no way this was a dream. It felt real. And I remember way too much about it. And there's the unusual fact I woke up in the way that I did. I have no idea what I saw. Maybe it was a ghost. Maybe it was an alien. I've got no idea, to be honest. But there was definitely something at the foot of my bed that night. It may be worth adding, and I told quite a few people about both these experiences, because I'm one of those types of people who really doesn't lie. I just tell stuff how it is. I saw something both nights and I wanted to know what people thought of my experience. No one has ever made fun of me for these encounters, which tells me they seem to believe me. Liam Sanderson. Now next we'll hear from other people who have also experienced something in their room at night. Our first experience was reported to me around 18 months ago. And due to an email mix-up, I've lost his contact details. So if you're out there, please get in touch, as I would love to talk with to you about the things you saw in your room as a child. Was it a rake? When I was four or five years old, I was staying at my grandparents' home, and I was going through some stressful times. I used to get uh, many bad dreams when I was around that age. But one dream stood out to me because it seemed extremely real. So much so 
So I had dreams that were less realistic based on this experience. I had a candle near my bed because I was scared of the dark. I'd woke it up sometime during the night and noticed that it was off. I was feeling very uncomfortable, so I hid under the covers and I was looking through the smallest crack in the quilt because I could hear some hissing in my room. I was trying to find out what was going on while still trying to stay hidden. The thing making the noise approached my bed. I think, but I don't remember the exact order of things, it grabbed or touched my leg, but somehow I was able to get up on my feet. I was told by adults that if I pretend to be a superhero, I could deal with monsters in bad dreams. So I did that. I shouted, I'm a superhero, hoping that would help. It didn't work, and I still felt terrified as I saw opposite me a creature that seemed far more detailed and physical than a dream monster normally is. It had a skeletal face with skin that clung to it, and the skin looked thin, hence why I said the face looked skeletal. It had big eyes. To compare it to things I would not seen in movies yet, at least I'd not seen Lord of the Rings at that point in time. What I was looking at looked similar to a golem or some of the orcs. Not exactly the same, but similar insofar as the skeletal features. It had big eyes and green skin. It had what looked like a flap of skin for hair that was similar to Yar Jar Binks or Cobra, but not exactly like that either. It had long, gangly, skinny body. And though it was taller than me, I don't think it was as big as an adult. Then it did something horrifying. It jumped on me, and I remember wrestling with it on the bed. It felt physical. But considering a five-year-old could hold their own with it, I can't imagine it was too strong. And it may not have been physical, but it felt as if it was. I remember at one point it bit my hand and I felt it. I don't think there was a mark because I'm sure that would have been noticed in the morning. My grandparents heard the commotion, so they came running down the hallway. But before they arrived at the door, this thing had evaporated. It left behind similar traces to what you'd get if you were looking at a light bulb for too long and then you turn away and you kind of see that shape broken apart in spots, but very similar to what you'd looked at before you looked away. I'm 25 now and this happened around the year 2000. I can't put an exact date on it, but it was when I was between probably four to six, somewhere like that. When I went to stay with my mum, I got visitations from these things, but in a less physical form. And there were two of them. One was green and the other was red. They seemed similar, but less physical these other times. I think they feed off fear, as I was never harmed. In those dreams, they only ever detained me. The first one stands out because of the realism. It felt completely real to me. I'm interested in unusual things now. And I'd like to understand the world we live in better. I have a background in anthropology, so I like looking at myths from all over the world. But I haven't seen anything of the same description. Our witness went on to add, I am open to the idea that there are different theories as to whatever these things are. I feel it could be a type of creature that can control their appearance. But they could also be a jinn or a kind of fae. There needs to be a taxonomy of whatever beings overlap this world with ours and if they're actually different types of beings or can they just change form or is how they appear due to us and our projection onto them. They are really good points and I've got to be honest, I have asked myself the same questions because I know exactly what it feels like to not only experience things in your waking moments but also to have your dreams invaded every night. I used to do the same thing as Liam. I'd get myself into the smallest size I could in my head and I'd imagine myself shrinking like really, really small. I even had a name for it. As a kid, we had a book and there was a story of Mrs Pepper Pot and she could shrink right down to a tiny size and I'd imagine myself doing the same. And it worked for a while. But they eventually, they sniff out your fear. 
there's no hiding from them. I was looking in the sense that someone would tell me what to do. They would tell me how to shrink them down instead of shrinking myself down and then push them out of the room. And that did work, and I still do it now with pain. But each time I beat them, they always came back, and they were bigger, more scary, and much more gruesome and far harder to beat. These events trouble me as an adult, so you can imagine what it's like for these children to have to go through this all of the time. It's absolutely terrifying, and I know that there are people out there listening who will empathise. Our next case is just terrifying, I'll be honest. He wore black clothes and his skin looked like the moonlight. Now, this next case was posted in a Facebook group by a gent who was trying to help a friend. And what you'll hear next are her words as she wrote them. I called him my monster when I was a little girl. He'd come across the field next to our house. He stood over seven feet tall and he wore black clothes. And his skin looked like the colour of the moonlight. His eyes were a dark red-black colour with a set of horns in the shape of a letter U. His hair was multicoloured and a little longer than his shoulders. I knew when he was going to come, my chest would throb. And without fear of the night, I'd go outside and meet him. I was a little girl at the time and it started when I was six years old. And he was a giant. And when he spoke, it was like a deep, gravelly growl. He always smelled like smoke and fire. And he would visit often. He was the most stunning male that I've ever seen. Years later, in the same house, my daughter was looking out of a bedroom window. And she saw a massive figure that was standing on top of the shop, which was a giant pole barn which was located right next door. She said she knew he was male and he was huge and it was like he was wrapped in the shadows. And the freaky part is she was the same age as I was when I first met him. i got to be honest, that report really played on my mind. I'm not sure why or if it was the suit, but it reminded me of a really lucid dream that I can still recall to this day. And I still can recall the level of fear that I felt. I would live between my mum's house and my nan's house, where my nan and granddad lived. And nan was my second mum. And I never had any night terrors when I stayed over with her. My grandparents lived in a long, rather than wide, flat. I think the Americans would call it an apartment. So there were like two flats on each floor, around five floors in each, and each flat had its own locking door. And the ladies took turns each week sweeping and mopping and swilling the common areas, like the stairs and the coal holes. The smell of pine disinfectant takes me right back. And at the side of the front door, there was a coal hole for storing your coal. And then the rooms were either side of this very long hallway. I was in my nan's room, which is the furthest away from the door. And I remember somebody calling my name, softly at first, but then insistent. I opened my eyes and I'm sat bolt upright in bed, probably only, what, five, six, something like that at the time. And I knew that there was a man coming and he was making his way down Cross Lane and he was headed right for me. And that voice told me to hurry up and shut the doors with my mind. I could see him. I could see him dragging one leg and I remember the colour of blood. He had a black D-mob suit on, a dapper hat and a white shirt and he looked thin and mean and in my head I shut every one of those doors, slamming them shut one after the other as he got nearer and nearer and I remember looking down the lobby and seeing him reach the front door before I had time to stop him. I don't remember anything else other than waking up <clears throat> to a kerfuffle. Because in those days, people would hang the door key on a string below the letterbox. And during the night, someone had put their hand in through the letterbox and tried for the keys. And I can still feel every inch of that dream. And I know I'm not the only one who's had dreams this lucid. I'll be honest, I don't think they are dreams. 
I think they are experiences that happen at our most vulnerable times. It happens when we are in our bed, in our most vulnerable place, a place that really should be your haven. And for me, it was a nightly war. One point I missed until recently is the fact that I only ever remember the bad parts, like the horrible negative parts. I never remember or ever mention the times that a voice has guided me out of a situation. Is that because I'm not supposed to remember that? Am I supposed to be trapped in an eternal ring of fear? It's a good way of keeping me and others that have been fed upon, keeps us worn out, distracted, so that we can be fed upon for a lifetime. In our next two cases, we move from inside our home into the night air. And as I share some events that are no doubt still troubling the witnesses to these experiences. I wanted to tell you an incident, Deb, that happened to me and my friend when we walked to a barbecue a couple of years ago now. The walk takes us an hour in total. It doesn't matter. The night was warm, it was clear, and it was really pleasant to be out. And as we walked along the thin path between the town of Abingdon towards the village of Drayton, it became very dark, and unless a car came past, there was no light out there at all. However, our eyes had become adjusted to the dark. And when the cars passed, we just stopped, looked away, you know, so you don't get blinded. At some point, we noticed the crickets had stopped making a racket and everything was completely still. I had no feeling of fear, but we both became more aware of our surroundings at that point. We were on a path and on the left there was the road and then a ditch and then just cornfields. The side we were on was the grass verge, had a thin path and an old hedgerow that was about 10 foot tall on the other side and then just some crops. We both slowed down due to the sudden quiet. And then over the hedge, without a sound, came a bright white light that floated in a random way, in the way a dandelion seed would if it was caught in the air. It then, in a deliberate way, went straight down in front of us so it was at our eye level, and again, without a sound, it came towards us and stopped about five feet away. To me, it turned to face us, although it was a circle of light. After a few seconds, it shot up fast again, and with no sound, it went across the road, and it continued on its random flight. Its size, when in front of me, was around the size of an apple or an orange. However, no matter how far away it got, it looked to be the same size. Of course, due to the distance, it must have been bigger. We carried on walking and it went out of sight. I have no idea what this was, but I thought it might be of interest to someone. Now, in our last report tonight, we go to Dromfield in Derbyshire. And the strange case of the mystery growl. Hi, Deborah. After weeks of deliberating on how to give my account or say what my experience was, I'm finally ready to share. The first definitive experience I remember, and I say definitive because I've had years of weird experiences, but in this one, I wasn't alone. It was 2015, the end of August, and it had just gone dark. I decided to walk the dogs as usual on our usual route. We're walking down to the Terry South Road. And I lived past there, even further towards the bottom. And there used to be a Tesco shop. And at the rear of the shop, there's a car park. Now, that car park does have cameras. But they're only lit by the usual street lighting. It's not very well lit. The car park was usually empty of cars. As I walked down the road, I could see my neighbour. And uh, she was outside her home with a friend. And they were chatting and having a smoke. So I crossed over to the opposite side of the road, just past the car park. It's fairly dark, that's because the car park backs onto some rear gardens. I walked past the entrance of the car park and I remember hearing a noise, a sound I can't describe. It was really weird. It was kind of gurgly, this rumbling growl. It even had a cat sounding purr to it. Whatever it was, it didn't sound like a typical cat. It was quite deep 
and chesty and long. And I looked up in the darkness. And I saw no movement, no eye glint, nothing. I expected to be pounced on as the sound ended. But the dogs didn't flinch. So I thought I was hearing things. But then the neighbour shouted across to me, Are you still walking the dogs after hearing that? So I shouted, so it wasn't my imagination then. And she shook her head, no. So whilst walking the dog, I did wonder what the heck I'd just heard. I kept questioning myself as to what to do to get some answers. And as I was about to completely pass the car park, I looked back into the darkness from a different angle to see if there was any movement or any shape or any eye shine. But there was nothing. But at this point, after some of the other things that I'd witnessed, I was beginning to feel jinxed. I kind of chuckled and shook my head and just carried on walking the dog. And when I got back, I was a bit shell-shocked. I know that evening I couldn't settle, and going to bed I could hardly sleep for trying to work out what I'd heard. I couldn't let this go in case it was an enlarged escape animal from the circus, because we had them around here a few months ago. So I decided to ring the RSP the X. RSPCA the next day and asked them what had happened. I felt a bit of an idiot trying to explain what happened, but I did my best. And what helps is that there were other witnesses to the noise if they needed to speak to them. So I rang the RSPCA and they were really quite good about it. The cellophonist was quite good and she asked me what I thought the noise was. So I tried to describe it. She asked me if I thought it was a dog or a cat. And I said I'd been around all kinds of dogs and other family members with cats. And in fact, all kinds of birds and small animals. I'm used to those noises. And the noise we heard was not doggish, not cattish. It was also the deepness and the length of the rumble that was confusing. I tried to explain to her that it wasn't like a full throttle growl or a groan. It sounded like a mixture of sounds. Because it wasn't like it was saying, be scared of me. It was more like a sound that was warning me, stay away, I am here. Now, the next time I saw my neighbour, I told her that I rang the RSPCA. And I told her that I tried to describe the noise of the sounds. And I did explain that there'd been a circus in the area that probably had animals with it. We debated for a while about what we thought and we'd heard. I tried to forget about it. Every night I walked the dogs hoping I was going to be safe. But then, a few months later, it happened again. And I was down at our caravan, which is in Skagness, Lincolnshire. I was walking the dogs on the normal night routine. We went around the campsite, which does have other campers on it, but it's not a huge site. It does have some semi-resident caravans as well as a tent field and some caravans that are in storage. It has a main road, which goes to Boston on one side, a farmer's field on three sides with a farmhouse in the middle surrounded by trees, walls and farm buildings. The nighttime walk down the pebbly drive of the site is walled off on one side with fir trees on the other and a fence. As I got to the end of the bit of the wall, I heard from over the wall the same sound, the same low rumble, rumble noise I'd heard in Sheffield. And this time it was shorter in length than the last time. I looked straight to my dogs to see if they'd heard of any anything. They didn't react. There was no response from them. The dogs didn't react, so it's now made me wonder if I've actually heard this. I'm questioning myself. I turned to go back the way I'd come, and I just hoped nothing would jump out on me from over the wall. By this time I was freaked out and concerned as to what was out there. It scared me that something was in the countryside roaming free that was making that kind of growl. It scared me so much I've not walked the, walked the dogs to lay at night anymore. All the campers walk their dogs after the club closes on the site. So I just make sure I walk the dogs before they all walk their dogs so I'm not the last one out there. Also, I've been experiencing being woken up to knocks on the caravan side. At first, because I was partially asleep, the initial reaction I got was to go and look outside to see who it was out there. But then a thought crossed my mind. If it was a friend or a campmate, they would have called out something, like, you know, like, wake up. But there was complete silence between the knocks, and I got the shivers. 
Another thought crossed my mind. What will I see if I open the blinds? And these stupid blinds in the caravan make a bit of a noise going up and down. I chickened out because it was just me and my young daughter on our own. The next morning, I asked if anyone had knocked on my caravan last night, but nobody had and most of them were in bed. I stayed up really late, to be honest, due to nerves. It was about 2am when I heard the knocking. I've seen stuff down there in the cornfields and in the trees and hedgerows. I can't walk far because the site is small, so I drive the dogs to walk different places and one time, I drove to a nearby road to walk them there. It's a farmer's field that has somewhere to pull into to park. Relatively busy road, it has cars and tractors going up and down it most of the day. The fields of Skegness have ditches dug out around the sides, so when it rains, the water runs off around the ditches between the fields. I suffer from arthritis, so I can't walk a great distance, and it has to be fairly flat. I've also got older dogs, and one of them struggles with distance and heat. I put the dogs on a long, extendable lead, and after a short distance of walking, the older dogs started pulling and crossing over the, the other side of the road, you know, playing up and barking at the ditches on the opposite side from where we were. And the ditch had dried out vegetation in it. It's filled with plants, so you can't see in it. And this day was really windy, so the vegetation was blowing around in the wind. So at first, I couldn't walk out, work out what they'd seen. I just wondered, was something in there? I couldn't see it. But then I got this weird feeling. I knew something wasn't right. Because the older dog is normally completely chill. By this point, he's overreacting at something. And he's normally that chill, we call him the couch potato. The young dog's the one that usually chases everything. Tissues, cigarette butts, you name it, she chases it. So for the older dog to start acting up made me start to feel a bit weird. I couldn't see anything. Nothing was in the hedge. I couldn't see anything in the greenery. And I couldn't at first hear anything or any movement. But Benji, my dog, started jumping around sideways, pulling on the lead. I couldn't understand what was going on. I knew there was something in the vegetation because whatever it was, I knew I needed to move quickly. I locked the extendable leads and I walked down the road faster a little bit while I was kind of freaked out by what the dog had done and by what had just happened. But I couldn't see anything, but I did start to hear movement as the grass moved around in the wind. Something was moving in the vegetation and at first it sounded slow, but then it seemed to move faster and I tried to convince myself that it was walking away. I can't help thinking, oh my gosh, so I pull the dog's lead and I'm, come on, come on, come on. I told them both to stop being daft and I walked a little bit further down the road, realising I'd gone in the wrong direction and then dreading having to turn round and go back past it to the car. On this road, there's an area that has a gated driveway and it has a wire fence around it. It's enclosed, some fir trees in there and I can see that there's something at the base of the tree. And suddenly both dogs seem to pull towards this area. I'm trying to get them back to the car and they're trying to pull me towards it. They're still pulling towards that side of the road. But I'm pretending that everything's fine. I just wanted to get back to the safety of my car. I was worried that either somebody or something, as my back was turned, would come out from their cover of that ditch. I've seen other things in the hedge when I've been walking the dogs. Another time when the dogs were again me down on the private road and I saw something move between the hedges. Because the dogs were playing up, I was focusing on them and not what I saw. And when my brain caught up with itself, I did a backward walk to look back into the hedge and try and see whatever I'd seen was there, but it wasn't. But I heard it plunge into the hedge, causing crows in the trees to fly out. In all the years I've been camping in this area, I've never seen a single fox. I've never heard a fox call. I've never seen the deer. The only wildlife I've ever seen in that area have been birds, and all kinds of birds. The same road, with the long wavy grass and the dog pulling incident, I was on there, and a few days after, I decided to revisit. My dog's behaved this time. It was a pleasant walk. No pulling of the re leads, no pulling to the side of the road. 
The long vegetation hid the ditches, and every so often there was a clearing for rainwater to run off from the road to stop the flooding. But halfway down the road, when I'd walked past a couple of days before, and in the chest-high grass, there came a gap which the farmer had made for the rain. I nearly walked past it, but when I looked down, there's a medium-sized brown deer in there. I saw no blood, had a big hole in its stomach, no insides that I could see. But it had to be fairly fresh. There was no blood on the road. And it, it didn't appear to be any flies that I could see. I mentioned what I'd seen to one of my mates on the site. And they said it would have been hit by a car. But the damage seemed more like a bite mark. And now I'm petrified what's going on here. So I started to think there may be big cats or something large evading humans in the field. Then the last time I went down to the caravan... It was a tree. It's not a very big tree, but it appears to have died. It was dried up with no leaves on it, but all the litter that had been strewn across the road, cups and cans and bottles, you name it, was stuck onto the tree branches. I would missed it at first. I thought they'd been blown there. But as I passed the tree, I looked at the items, and you could see that they were pierced and placed onto the tree. I'm not sure what kind of person would pick litter up around there, and then stick it in a tree. And I realised that from a distance, the tree shimmered because of the sun. So it looked like a Christmas tree in the daylight, which I thought was a bit weird. I tried to dismiss it, but I can't help thinking what kind of person would pick up litter from the side of the road, take the time and trouble to stick them on a tree to make it look like it had been decorated. Now I hasten to hat. I haven't walked the dogs there again as I'm scared of what I might find. After a lifetime of encounters, I have always wanted to talk about them, but I've never found anyone to tell who I thought wouldn't judge me or laugh in my face. I sought to find answers to some of my experiences after I bought myself an iPad, which was the birth of the internet for me. I sent emails to relevant bodies, both of whom I'd asked who was the best person to help, but being scared of being judged has stopped me. I know how it feels to have to hide what's happening around you. I know what it's like to be out with the dogs and suddenly know you're not alone. I know what it's like to hear bangs on walls, doors, knocks on the ceilings, things that fly off me walls, dark shadows on the stairs. I think some of you do as well. Well, I know some of you do as well. I know that you will not sit in judgment or play judge, jury and executor. You guys are far more attuned than that. We're accepting and most definitely more worldly, wise. Enough to know that strange things happen to ordinary people every day. And as you can see here tonight, there are so many of us experiencing what others deem impossible, living with the confusion as to whether the experience was a real event, a very lucid dream, an hallucination, living with a lifetime of visitors in your room. There are thousands of us who each night experience a new horror or trying to stay sane on limited sleep with maximum disturbance. The next time you see a tired colleague, or a friend with dark circles around their eyes, remember, they may be going through far more than even you think. Thank you for joining me tonight. And wherever you are in the world, have a blessed day and a restful night. Good night. Bye for now.